Welcome to the Institute for National Security Studies podcast series in Tel Aviv. I'm your host for today, Tuja Gering. I'm a researcher with the Leon Guilford Glazer Israel China Policy Center at the Institute here in Tel Aviv and a non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council Global China Hub. In uh, September, just a few months ago, we had a pretty major event in Beijing. It was the second Middle East Security Conference. And it was headed with a keynote speech by a then foreign minister and state councillor Wang Yi. And that is when he unveiled what he called China's new security architecture for the Middle East. In the forum that was held for a couple of days, you had about 70 dignitaries from all countries of the region. And there they talk about China's new solution for all the problems that mire our region here in Israel, in the Middle East. A few months later, in early December, you had Chinese leader Xi Jinping visit Saudi Arabia for three summits. Uh, the first one was hosted by the kingdom, Saudi Arabia. Another one was with the Gulf countries, the GCC. And the third with, all, with 21 members of the Arab League. And there you had some major announcements, including MOUs worth to the tune of $50 billion dollars and many grand statements about the strategic nature of cooperation between China and the region, and also a joint statement between China and the Gulf that uh, we will surely talk about today. And they also mentioned the new security architecture for the Middle East. And this architecture was repeated a third time, uh, just recently, a few weeks ago, when Iran's president, Ibrahim Raisi, visited Beijing. And there too, his visit mirrored a bit Xi Jinping's visit to Saudi Arabia, where both sides declared a joint statement and MOUs worth about $20 billion, and also used this word strategic a lot to describe the nature of the relationship. So to help us understand what China's new security architecture for the Middle East mean, I'm very happy to welcome today uh, Senior Colonel uh, Joe Bolt. And he's retired now, and he's a senior fellow with the Center for International Security and Strategy at Tsinghua University, and a China Forum Scholar. In his uh, military capacity, Professor Zhou was director of the Center for Security Cooperation of the Office for International Military Cooperation of the PLA uh, under the Ministry of National Defense. Um, very warm uh, welcome to you, uh, Tobo. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Tobia, for having me here. Um, and it really is, it's a pleasure. So over the last week, uh, we got to spend during the INSS International Conference, and we got to talk a lot about security and also about China and the greater region. Uh, we got to discuss the war in uh, Ukraine, and I would love to touch on all these topics today, but just to kick us off, to set the stage, when did China become interested in the Middle East? And when did the Middle East become interested in China? Because it wasn't always the case. Well, I think China's interest in the Middle East is certainly growing. Apparently, China uh, is interested in energy uh, import. Uh, that is the most obvious, and probably people's memory rests just on that. But mm -hmm. it's more than that. Nowadays, uh, uh, China's influence is global. So China's uh, economy activities are also ubiquitous everywhere. So with that, and nowadays, we could see you know, a very much diversified investment in the, in the Middle East. And uh, w once I was in uh, uh, Abu Dhabi, I uh, just went into the so-called Dragon City. Mm. And I found that there are so many Chinese living there, people talking about probably 200,000. Yeah, and I saw 400,000 last time. Oh, I see. Yeah. And I even asked one, uh, one uh, one entrepreneurs, you know, about the, these uh, materials for infrastructure building. How much uh, do they come from uh, China? And he paused for a moment and said, 100 percent. How? That really surprised me, you know. When you say 100 percent, you have to have a, a great courage, right, <laughs> to, to, to say that. And then I understand, you know, how China has actually occupied a uh, uh, lion's share, yeah, in the in the Middle East market, 
Uh, that was, of course, the UAE. But then in Israel, I know the Chinese workers are doing uh, construction here, and they are just uh, found in different uh, sectors of life. And this must be the case with almost all the countries, uh, including your, your rivalry, if not enemy, in Iran. So China's mm -hmm. cooperation is also uh, intensive. But uh, putting all this together, so China is deeply, deeply engaged in the Middle East. And that would, of course, invite uh, uh, some other issues uh, other than economic, right? Then it's about security. And how about this, uh, security here in the Middle East? And how about the safety of these Chinese people working here? Yeah, for sure. And when uh, Xi Jinping visited uh, the region just recently, that was his second in his official capacity after 10 years uh, in power. And this is also the 10th year anniversary of the Belt and Road Initiative, which he had unveiled back in 2013. And since that time, some of the numbers that we're talking about, uh, just to give the viewers some idea, uh, in 2021, the trade was to the tune of $330 billion between China and just the Arab states, excluding Iran and Israel and Turkey. And the, China is involved in over 200 large infrastructure projects, and I'm talking about ports and bridges and roads and rail tracks and power stations and even entire cities, if we look just at Egypt's new administrative capital. And it really is spectacular, and it's not just uh, in infrastructure, uh, physical, it's also in other aspects of infrastructure for the future, the way I call it, in all these different Silk Roads. you got this big web of a digital Silk Road, uh, we talk about smart cities and Huawei infrastructure, 5, 6G, and also green infrastructure, green Silk Road with renewable energy, nuclear energy, and also space Silk Road, uh, where joint satellite launches and mm. Beidou, Mm. Uh, cooperation, and then we also have a health Silk Road, especially after COVID, uh, China has established redistribution and even manufacture centers for vaccines, uh, which is pretty amazing. And then when you look at it, you take a step back and you see China really has become an important player. Okay? We don't need to use the word central or the most important, but certainly no one will gain say it's not important. Mm. It is very important to local people. Um, and even perhaps indispensable in some ways. But there was one area where it has not been so involved in all this large gamut of topics we mentioned, uh, security and politics. It seems that on this area, China is still a bit skittish. Do you agree? Uh, I think so. Uh, well, when you're talking about all these things, what I'm thinking is that uh, the world is not uh, only a about uh, uh, West versus the rest, but the rest actually is much bigger, right? If it is the global south and we're all in this region, uh, so China is certainly uh, investing a lot in the Middle East, but equally in, in Africa and in Oceania, everywhere. So what makes uh, uh, the Middle East different is uh, actually the internal uh, you know, uh, chaos uh, or the, in, the uh, under lining uh, 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 the, the potentials for conflicts. Uh, for China, we, we wish all these uh, uh, hot spots or conflicts would be gone, but that, that of course, is simply wishful thinking. So, so, China, so, so far, China has been very careful, you know, in tiptoeing on a tight rope, yeah? Just, to, just to, you know, bend down to do business without uh, getting too much involved. But the things could, could change. Uh, first of all, what if uh, Chinese uh, workers are hijacked? Yeah, yeah for, it happens. Uh, yeah, it, it happens. All the time. Yeah, it, it even happened in Pakistan, which yeah. uh, put its foreign policy uh, you know, uh, on a good relationship with China. In Balochistan, things happened. And uh, they, they, they do not hate Chinese, but they just hijack Chinese for ransom and uh, for uh, the resentment toward the Pakistani government. So it could happen here. So these kind of things yeah, may just uh, definitely would become more because Chinese involvement are becoming more. Uh, that is a natural re result. The other thing is uh, how could China you know, avoid being uh, siphoned into this black holes, big and small, you know, you don't like each each others. I mean, Israel and and the, and the Iran. And for us, this is difficult for us to to make a choice. 
and then there are some uh, so many uh, sub-regional uh, you know hotspots so China has to be very careful mm. and you said of course our situation in our neighborhood is not very quiet and even before we talk about the West it's just interestingly uh, here in our neighborhood we don't get along mm. as you said mm. uh, and this is not an ideal world we wish it would mm. be but facing these facts that China's interests are increasing, its engagement is growing. Mm. Until now, we had this arrangement where China had to rely, like all of us, on a Western American, namely security architecture. After the Cold War, where it became a unipolar moment, I know it's for a short while, mm. but still, uh, in the last 30 years or so, mm. uh, the US involvement turned it into the indispensable power. And this is something that is not going away. And I, of course, don't subscribe to the idea that the U.S. is withdrawing from the region. I don't see it. Maybe it just superficially. But the U.S. is still here to stay. That's how they say it. That's the way uh, we see it. And now this may create complications. And the question is, will China be able to still maintain this balance or this more aloof position? Because... We have growing engagement. We have sea lines of communications that you have to protect. Uh, you talk about hijacking, and it was just over 10 years ago during the Arab Spring in 2010, 2011, you had to evacuate 35,000 Chinese nationals just from Libya. And during that time, China had to rely on the benevolence of other actors, namely Western. And now with the great power competition and the fraught nature of the relationship between China and the West, and the U.S. and Europe, uh, the situation has changed a bit. And this le leads many uh, of our colleagues in China. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, Professor uh, Yang Cheng. He's a former diplomat. And he was talking recently about the war in Ukraine and how it will affect the situation uh, of China's position in the Middle East. And to him, he thinks that there's now a consensus among Chinese scholars, his colleagues, that China has to increase its security and political involvement in the Middle East. Uh, there's just no way around it. On the other hand, you have people like uh, Niu Xinxuan from uh, Kikir, and he thinks that it's still up for debate. And of course, all of them agree, even when the, they say the East is rising, the West is declining, it's still just relative. America is here to stay. So how do you reconcile with this situation? We have growing engagement on the other hand, one hand, and on the other hand you have this, all these competing interests of China's own interests, U.S. and great power, and everything kind of mixed together. It's very complicated. What does the future hold? Well, those are just academic debates, but I used to be a practitioner for many, many years, and I myself have been China's coordinator of counter-piracy operation in the Gulf of Aden. So that, of course, was in the Indian Ocean, which is not so far away from you, right? Uh, so talking about the China-US rivalry, I believe basically is in the uh, Western Pacific. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is uh, basically at China's doorstep. Uh, apart from, uh, 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 you know, the China's coast and the, the water in the South China Sea, we don't have a real significant uh, China-U.S. rivalry in security areas. In the it, South China Sea? Uh, apart from South China Sea and Chinese, Chinese coast, you know, we do not have a, a, a serious rivalry elsewhere because it is not at all China's intention to become a world police. Uh, yeah. And yeah, and we, the, the, the real question is probably how India might view China's uh, military presence in the Indian Ocean, because mm. India traditionally yeah, consider, yeah, they are, they just still talk about it, the so-called net security provider, which uh, I disagree. How can you become a net security pro uh, provider of the whole Indian Ocean? Uh, is there a, because it is full of uh, in, uh, strategic international sea lanes, and uh, we uh, are operating there. Yeah. Can you explain a bit what do you mean by net security provider? What what India means by that? Yeah, yeah India means probably that means there is a sole security provider. Hmm. Yeah, oh, uh, to the Indian Ocean, which is is a is a bit uh, you know uh, a kind of Indian uh, Hinduist uh, and uh, Hindu nationalist uh, point of view because some of them believe in the, the so-called Akan Bharat, which believes that you know the the a very big region 
even including Bhutan, Tibet, mm. Sri Lanka being Indians, Indian territory. That, because out of this kind of a concept, uh, you would uh, probably consider Indian Ocean to be India's ocean, which is, uh, which is not true. So that is why uh, from time to time we would find the Chinese uh, uh, military vessels uh, in Sri Lanka being a problem for India. Well, yeah, yeah, with, uh, Yuan Wang. yeah, yeah. Even if you, you even if you believe, believe it's a spy ship, that is at least in uh, Sri Lanka's territorial water for replenishment. And mm -hmm. what is a spy ship? That is for you know observing you know, the, the the activity in, in outer space, which may or may not uh, you know have anything to do with, with India. So that is what I'm thinking. If one day, and I don't believe it would be very far away, when Chinese aircraft carriers. So into into Indian Ocean, mm. how would the Indians think about it? And India so far has been trying very carefully, you know, to make it strike a balance you know, among the major power relationship. But because uh, uh, the mentality would this uh, be a great challenge for the mentality? And then in the Middle East, uh, I think China's uh, uh, you know interest there would just continue. But uh, we know Americans would be there. Even for you know your ironclad uh, relationship, they would still be, be be there. So this kind of a talk, I agree with you, is superficial. That is, the Americans will withdraw. They may not need oil from uh, the Middle East anymore, but uh, still they have huge interest to be there. Then the question is, uh, in what circumstances would the Chinese interest clash with American uh, interest? I can hardly think uh, of a tangible scenario. While we are so deeply involved in economic activities, uh, we would definitely would uh, have a, an inevitable, uh, you know, clash of interests. That doesn't look look like the case. For example, mm. you would be theoretically in a difficult situation because you are staunch allies of the United States. But if we keep doing business with you in agricultural sectors, you know. In, in some other non-sensitive uh, yeah, uh, areas, yeah, yeah. So it it should it should be okay, right? And and you can talk straight, yeah, to yeah. Americans. Why can't we cooperate in these areas? Yeah, that's right. And uh, I would love to drill a bit more on that. So from what you're saying, on the surface, uh, and it's not just you; it's also some of the experts I've cited, like Neil Xinchun. He said there's no conflict of interest between China and the U.S. Uh, in other areas, of course, there's a lot of conflict, but here in the Middle East, this can be like our small kingdom of heaven, where mm. all of our interests are in line. Because after all, mm. uh, both sides, China and the U.S., are interested in regional peace, mm. in security, mm. prosperity, mm. and everyone can agree on that, right? Mm. Mm. However, in the um, security, second security uh, forum that we talked about uh, in the beginning in September, you see China is beginning to perhaps uh, step on the toes of the U.S. security uh, in the region. Uh, so it's not just in agriculture and in education and all these very civilian, non-military aspects. China is, by definition, declares that it wants to become involved in security because uh, then they declare, for, first they call it the Middle East Security Forum. And then you have uh, now the senior Chinese diplomat, Wang Yi, uh, unveil this new security architecture for the Middle East. And the word new, I think, is the key word here, mm -hmm. uh, because this means there's an old security architecture for mm -hmm. the Middle East mm -hmm. that China thinks it can improve upon. Is that a correct, thing, correct way to put it? I think so. I think uh, China... Uh, being heavily involved in the uh, Middle East, of course, would be concerned with the security. And because of this kind of a security relationship in the region are so complicated, but uh, because China is involved, therefore China wants to do something. But uh, I think uh, talking about these principles are fine, and it shows China really has a role, but uh, again, it's almost like in the, uh, the proposal about a peace plan in Ukraine. Mm. It is short of a tangible roadmap. And then the question is, uh, you know, if uh, roadmaps uh, cannot be, uh, you know, uh, received by all the parties, what is the use of the roadmap? So, so China's uh, proposal basically are more generous on principles. So, but so why offer them at all? If it's general, if it's not tangible? I think it, it is good for people to know China's attitude 
And China just proposal might evolve in the future when time is right. This is what I said, you know, at the, at the conference. Uh, for example, like uh, China's role in the six party talks, which eventually failed. In, uh, yeah, 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 on the, the, on the, the, yeah, on the uh, decolonization of the Korean Peninsula. Although this is six party talks basically has failed, but everybody would uh, would see China's positive role in you know, putting all these parties together. Yeah, and uh, then we have this uh, kind of a uh, Belt and Road Initiative uh, 10 years ago when it was put forward in you know, 2013. Nobody knew what it what uh, it was. Now you have talked in the beginning yeah. how it has uh, actually developed. So uh, with the lapse of time, China may just become you know a more concrete or constructive in its proposals. So these proposals themselves are not static. Yeah, they could survive, it, continue to grow. But still, uh, for me as a Middle Easterner as an Israeli, I say if if it's not broke, why fix it? We already have uh, an existing security architecture. It's by no means perfect. I mean, we like the Americans, but they're also not perfect. We're not perfect. Mm. Uh, but we have a security architecture mm. led by America. Israel mm. wants it. Gulf countries need it for mm. their own prosperity and survival. And it, it has worked. I mean, of course, we can talk about the many problems mm. uh, that it has caused. But it has also worked for China uh, because China gets 50% almost of its energy from the Middle East. It passes through the Strait of Hormuz. And it is U.S. deterrence that keeping the whole uh, thing from falling apart, uh, at least the way uh, uh, we see it here in the Middle East. And that's why we need it. And when I read about a new security architecture for the Middle East, I ask myself, why don't you just become involved in what's existing and improve it from the inside or uh, in other words integrate instead of interfere because in my in my mind it looks like uh, something that is alternative I don't want alternative I want better but I don't want a alternative hmm. uh, if that makes sense yeah of course uh, there is grain of truth in what you said if uh, uh, there is already a proposal that meets, uh, meets the needs of all parties, for example, uh, I definitely would say that uh, your Abraham Accords uh, are positive because uh, apparently you have improved your relationship with um, the surrounding countries. So I believe uh, if uh, something uh, is proven to be good, then people should accept it. But uh, China's attitude, uh, if China put forward yeah, with this proposal, I believe uh, it is also out of... Uh, uh, certain good reasons. And uh, this actually might uh, a question, could China and the U.S. actually cooperate in, in, in terms of security in the region? Yeah, you, you see, uh, the uh, counterparty operation in the Gulf of Aden is a typical example of yeah. how uh, major powers could actually, uh, you know, become uh, at least coalitions, you know, for common purposes. Mm -hmm. And um, this is uh, more feasible uh, for, for China in that if you examine PLA's operation overseas, you would find that they are all invariably in humanitarian areas, be it the peacekeeping, counterparts, or disaster relief. So China is not trying you know, to, to bomb anyone, to kill anyone. So in this regard, if, for example, if American strength is really in decline, um, how about we work together uh, to safeguard the, the strategic sea lanes? Yeah, Chinese Navy is growing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and if, uh, if you uh, I counted the ships of uh, China's uh, southern fleet and eastern fleet, each one of them is bigger than the Royal British uh, Royal British Navy, uh, one which is uh, it's the uh, biggest uh, in the world now. Yeah, which was once next to none, right? Mm -hmm. So th these ships, well, what's the use of having such, such a large navy? Of course, it is for protecting China's interests overseas and for. China to show its international obligations. So I believe, apart from a uh, you know sovereign issue uh, 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 at a China's home or near China's home, then we do not have uh, uh, much disagreement with the United States. So China is open-minded. So if uh, why don't we have a uh, why don't we just uh, throw away this kind of a Cold War mentality and become cooperative elsewhere? China and the U.S. join hands. It makes this world safer. Yeah, so for me as an Israeli, this is music to my ears. I would love nothing more, and I'm sure most mm. people in the Middle East, um, of course, are tired of having our little region become an arena for great power competition. Mm. But again, we're not in the ideal world, and I think there are some barriers to create 
this sort of cooperation that you mentioned. And, and I want to take you back uh, 25 years to your time in Cambridge. Mm. Uh, you wrote uh, a master thesis about ASEAN and collective security. Mm. And I think this is where the difference lies between China's collective or shared security and then you have the traditional uh, security. Um, and maybe uh, if you can talk about the different ways in which China views security, um, it, it could be for ASEAN and for the Middle East, and the uh, way the U.S. views security. And I think this is the source of the disagreement between the U.S. and China that might hinder such cooperation, because uh, in the Global Security Initiative and the New Security Architecture, the Global Security Initiative, uh, by the way, it's something that Xi Jinping uh, declared back in uh, April, uh, two months after the invasion of uh, Ukraine, and with the Global Development Initiative that he had uh, unveiled in September, the year before, uh, these are two major new initiatives. And just uh, a week and a half ago, uh, China released this big paper explaining a bit more about the Global Security Initi Initiative. So just a parenthes parenthesis here. So I think there's a difference between this collective security and this American or Western traditional security that creates this. I think there is a fundamental difference because if you look at uh, Xi Jinping's thoughts, yeah, mm -hmm. in terms of foreign policy, I would consider his ideas about the mankind of shared destiny is, a, of course, uh, is a top hat. Yeah. But but under it, uh, there are already, yeah, two uh, important initiatives. One is a global security initiative, other is a global uh, 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 development. development initiative. So as I told told you before. So China is good at you know you know just uh, developing some kind of uh, general ideas Big and yeah and then make them uh, becoming more tangible and uh, concrete uh, and uh, you know uh, concrete. Mm -hmm. On this um, global security initiative, I would say we already have a, a a lot of things in it. For example, the Belt and Road Initiative. It is something, it is tangible, right? Yes. Yeah, it is around the world, it is seen by everybody. So this is a, can be seen something, a kind of a genuine practice of this global, secure, this global development initiative uh, uh, in this uh, pillar. And then the other pillar is being developed, but uh, there are also something in it. For example, PLS operation overseas, mm -hmm. yeah? That are only confined to humanitarian area. This tells a lot of things. That tells you want to distance yourself from American practice, which for a number of reasons turned out to be <laughs> more bloody, to say the least, right? And, and Chinese overseas, PLA overseas, have not killed anybody, not even a pirate. They didn't have to because the U.S. were involved. Yeah, Was but, it, but, you, but, but, you know, Chinese are more cautious about using force. For example, in counter piracy. You are allowed to, you are, in counter piracy and the peacekeeping, you are allowed to use force. If you, if you read, you know, peace, peace, if you read the mandates of peacekeeping, they do not uh, say you, you can kill. They just say by all means. So by, China didn't by, use by, force. By, by every means, yeah. So China, China is very careful in peacekeeping. And then in counter piracy, we dispel the pirates, we apprehend the pirates, but we didn't try to kill them. So back, back to our region here in the Middle East, mm. of course, people here kill each other all the time. Mm. And when it comes to the tangible, concrete areas of security, mm. will China be able to cooperate with the US or not? Because if China does not offer anything tangible, and let's take uh, the most glaring example, and that is the Iran nuclear deal. Mm. Just uh, a week, week and a half ago, we got uh, news that Iran is now in 84% of enrichment. That is way, way above a civilian use bomb. So, okay, let's say it's just 60%, something mm -hmm. they've been doing for a long while now. Mm -hmm. And it feels like Iran is just hell-bent on getting the bomb. And we can agree that that's not China's interest. Uh, that is a declared position. Mm -hmm. uh, of China not. signed on the yeah, yeah. non-proliferation treatment. Mm -hmm. And China was also uh, important in the yeah. JCPOA. Yes. You can read John Garber. Yeah. He wrote yeah. about this. Yeah. And uh, your yeah. ambassador, uh, not, not ambassador, but a diplomat at the time, he had a very important role in facilitating uh, the relationship between Iran and the United States. But now we're in a very different ballgame. We're in a different situation where the relationship between 
the U.S. and China has almost never been lower. I mean, just look at the balloon mm. uh, incident. And now we're going to, we are reaching closer to a period that is very possible where either Iran is going to reach a bomb and mount it on a missile, or you're going to have a preemptive attack by Israel and the Gulf countries and the U.S., of course. And what will China do then? What about the Chinese security architecture and how will it help? This is where, uh, you know, the rubber meets the road. This is where tangible becomes extremely important and what China can do. I have been thinking about this issue. My direct answer is why don't you, as Americans, don't you allies, tell, you know, Americans, uh, do not scrap the JCPOA. You know, the Donald Trump made a mess. You, know, you see, everybody was working towards it, right? And to a great extent, the Iranians have accepted all this. But why would you just, just throw this away? You should tell, tell American government, because you're your allies. This is serves your best interest, yeah? Even for your own interest, for the so-called uh, ironclad commitment to you, they should not throw it away. And then uh, this uh, deal on such nuclear issues, you can imagine how complicated it is. Six-party talks simply failed. And then on this issue, it is different. People almost uh, have reached the agreement. And then because uh, of uh, some people in your country, and primarily because of uh, Donald Trump, they, they just scrapped it. And China was involved. So, so right now we're in a more dangerous situation. What for? So uh, I, I, I can disagree on what Trump did. And by the way, it was Israel that lobbied the U.S. to scrap the deal. Hmm. That is because Israeli policymakers thought at the time that the deal was a terrible deal. Uh, most importantly, because even during the implementation period, over these years, China, uh, sorry, Iran never stopped in its proliferation. It never stopped creating proxy. Mm. Uh, powers all across the region, especially in our neighborhood. Mm, mm. And if uh, I use a Chinese way of thinking, for example, we talked this week a lot about uh, the cause for the war in Ukraine. And mainly uh, we discussed, uh, or the Chinese official position is that it is NATO expansionism, right? That started it. Of course, Russia is committing the attack. It's viol making all these violations of human rights, but it's the root cause is the U.S. and NATO and their expansion is over this last 20 years and not listening to Russia or taking into account its fear of influence traditionally, uh, right? And I, I'd like to ask, if we apply this logic uh, of China here in the Middle East, we have for more than 20 years, we have for 40 years, this regime that is by definition self-described revolutionary and it is extremist and it spreads its proxies in our region and it creates its own exclusive security. What about Israel's legitimate security interests? But what about the Gulf legitimate security interests? And that we did not have during the JCPOA, yeah. and we don't have it now. Yeah. And uh, where does China stand on that? Today? But, but let me uh, ask you a simple question. Before that, I, I must agree, uh, say that uh, what you're talking about, uh, Iran, is uh, very much uh, every I Israel would talk in almost in the same tone. That is totally understood. But let me ask uh, one question, very simple question. Please. Com comparing the situation now and uh, the time when before uh, JCPOA was uh, scrapped, are we, are the situation more dangerous or not? Uh, for us, yes. For China, no. And this is, I think, the moral hazard of the whole story. Because China can absorb if we have some Jews or some Arabs dying from Iranian terrorism. Mm. It does not risk China's interest. However, when China gets a nuclear bomb, you're going to have Saudi Arabia right after it, the UAE, Egypt, and we might even have a war that will definitely uh, risk all of China's interests. Well, that, that's exactly what and I said. And this is our security versus China's security now. That's exactly what I said, because you have already answered this question. If you believe the situation right now is more dangerous you know, than before uh, the JCPOA was scrapped, that means you made a wrong decision. That, that clearly uh, it tells that because the situation has become more dangerous. Therefore, you, are, uh, you actually have invited this kind of uh, danger. And, uh, well, and there was a possibility right. that you yeah. have to you know, launch it. But, but what do we do now? What do we do now? In, in case this not very speculative uh, scenario where we're going to have 
a showdown in the Middle East. What will China do? Will it be able to cooperate with uh, the United States or at least not interfere uh, or even support Israel, support the Gulf countries in protecting their own security over Iran's exclusive security over an Iran proxies? Or is the great power competition is so strong right now and because Iran is more closer to China today than it was in the past and it's more against the United States and China is against the United States then China will just you know show show panguang will just stand aside and even support Iran I don't think so I think on this issue of non-proliferation China is uh, as decisive as everybody else that uh, Iran should not de declare develop nuclear weapon that position uh, uh, definitely is there because of China's uh, you know, decade old policy mm -hmm. you know, on nuclear weapons. You see, China actually has changed a lot of its defense policies, but not this one on um, no use of nuclear weapons against nuclear weapon free countries or regions. And China would have never be the first one to use nuclear weapons. So, on this kind of a commitment, China is ironclad. So, mm -hmm. therefore, I do not believe uh, there is a difference, even because of uh, major power rivalries that China and the U.S. would uh, would uh, be di would differentiate. Yeah, on this kind of uh, policy, the only thing is, uh, how could we achieve this? Mm -hmm. Then the, the question is, I believe uh, through my talks with people, I believe the uh, Iranians themselves are actually, you know, not that resolute in uh, devel developing a bomb because they know clearly the consequences, whether you would launch a preemptive strike or not, well, I don't know, because you people actually have uh, kept a kind of a deliberate ambiguity on it to call, to say that all options are on the, on the table. But they sh should know that this would be very much consequential. Mm. But then if you strike on, uh, on Iran, then that could uh, not solve this problem. It might just, uh, you know, create more problems because uh, militarily speaking, Iran is not such a weak country. So nobody wants, wants this to, to happen. But I believe uh, this kind of uh, attitude, uh, this kind of uncertainty in the attitude of Iran probably is a, is a chance for all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we should actually see this chance and do not turn it into reality. Do not make this situation more dangerous. We still have time. Yeah, I, I like to hope so too. And we need to wrap up, so I'd like to ask just a final question. Uh, after a week here, this has been your second time uh, in Israel, and we heard a lot of uh, talks and interesting conversation about uh, regional security, and I want to ask uh, personally, uh, not just uh, China's official position, uh, has any of your views changed or you have like a major takeaway uh, from this uh, visit to our uh, little neighborhood? No, I, I didn't, but I do feel more about how your people feel mm. about the whole situation here. And, uh, and uh, one of the things on my mind is uh, how this kind of a China-US competition might intensify uh, and that would actually put you as Don Chala of the United States uh, in, in a worse position because that would be very difficult to you. So mm. that is why I said uh, at the end of the conference uh, yesterday that we know, you know, Jewish people are most clever people on us. No, but we, but <laughs> <laughs> some, some people say that. But uh, we, we also know you are strong jealous of the United States. That's true. So, so putting all this together, that means you should not blindly follow other people's instruction. You should de de decide uh, on things uh, out of your national interest. We, we know you won't take Chinese side, even uh, in a Western scenario, but that would put you in a very difficult situation. We do not want you to choose to, to, choose, to pick a side. We, we don't want sides at all. Yeah, but, 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 but just uh, uh, things, you, you know, issues would crop up, but think out of your national interest, mm -hmm. yeah, out of impartiality, who is right and who is wrong, and make your own right decisions. In that I absolutely agree. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Professor Cholo. It's Thank been a you. pleasure. Thank you.